Hey, Jazz Bear, how are you doing? By now, you're probably on your winter break, and what better time than now to read you a story? Because you'll actually be home to see it and to hear it. And this one's going to be from your great grandma, my mom, your great grandma. And the story is called What? And it's about her life in Arkansas. It's a true story. Living in the country makes you a better listener, or so I think. You seem to learn and listen for the rooster in the morning to tell you it's time to get up. He crows so loud to wake up everything and everyone near and far. We always had big roosters and some called Banty roosters. The Banty is a little boy chicken or that's the way my mama told me. He struts around thinking he is really big. He scratches at the ground and twists his neck all around with his big old eyes just shining. He walks up to the big old rooster and the talk goes something like this. Hey, you can just clear her out because I'm the big one around here, says the small rooster. You see, he has no sense on his size. Get lost, says the big rooster, and continues to look at the fine ladies that are his to watch over. Perhaps I didn't make myself clear, says the banty. I'm taking over the chicken yard. And all the fine ladies too, says the Banty rooster. You and whose army, says the big rooster. The Banty ruffles up his feathers, looking as mean as he can get. He cocks his head to one side, scratches the ground, while looking up at the big red rooster. The red rooster, meanwhile, is still ignoring the Banty rooster while scratching up some corn scattered out for them to eat. The Banty has given him warning. Yep, he warned him good. Now he would just have to get tough. Ooh, he's very brave, but not too smart. He struts up to the red rooster and all of a sudden he jumps into the air like he's going to give him a karate kick. He misses. And again, he struts about scratching at the ground <laughs> just to show how vicious he really is. The big rooster just has to be taught a lesson and that's for sure. The ladies are looking at him kind of snickering in a chicken snicker. This really stirs up the banty. He makes a run at the big rooster with his eyes closed because he can't stand to see the terrible damage he is about to do to this big bird. He should have kept his eyes open because just before he smashes into that big bird, the big rooster, having ate all the corn in the spot, decides to move on. Uh-oh. He moves just far enough that the banty flew straight into the biggest and the prettiest red leghorn female chicken in all the yard. Now he was so embarrassed. While well, he was thinking of how terrible his judgment was on that leap and not paying attention to the big rooster, he saw a shadow come over him. Uh-oh, what is this? It was so big that for a minute the banty thought for sure it was the eclipse of the sun. The big bird turned that banty rooster every which way but loose. Finally, when there was no doubt who was the boss, the big rooster gave him one last kick and moved away. The banty waited until he was on the other side of the yard and raised one wing and shook it at the big bird as if to say, I'll be back. You haven't seen the last of me. Grandma was watching that on her porch. I watched all this while sitting on the back steps. I was making circles in the dirt with the bare toe. It was hot and sweat came even though I hadn't done anything but the daily chores. Usually on this day, my mom would build a fire under a big iron pot that stayed in the yard. She'd fill it with water drawn from the well, and while it heated, she would use a rub board to wash the clothes. Oh, 
Oh, she's outside washing clothes. She had no washing machine, only that rub board. She heated the water and then she put some in a big tub. And with soap she had made, she would rub the soap on the clothes and then move them up and down that rub board. She'd do this until all the dirt was gone. While this was going on, the other clothes would be in the big pot boiling and this would loosen all the dirt so she could finish the wash in the tub with the rub board. I remember my brother and I wanting to help and asked if we could help hang out the clothes. We had no clothesline and when she finished a piece of clothing she'd say, just take it and throw it over the fence. There was a fence all around the yard to keep the animals out and we always used the fence around the side of the house to hang the clothes on. Finally my mom finished the wash, poured all the wash and rinse water out and walked around the house to admire the finished large wash. She was shocked. So your great great grandma would just tell your great grandma and your great uncle to just, what she said, just take it and throw it over the fence. That's what she'd tell them to do with the clothes, just take it and throw it over the fence, okay? So they're supposed to throw it over the fence to dry, over the fence. You know what I mean? Like the clothes are laying on the fence. So she was shocked as she saw we had minded real well. We had taken every piece and thrown it over the fence, right into the dirt on the other side. Oh, she did this once a week ever since I could remember. Now I wanna to read to you a second story for great grandmas. And it's about her life on the farm. It's called Imagination and Curiosity. In a farming community, neighbors are usually a distance away, so you rely on those in your family that are around as there are no other humans nearby, either small or large. Animals should soon grow tired of being chased with a corn stalk or chased across plowed ground that the cows used to search for bits of grass. Just for time's sake, eliminate all the things operated by electricity as we had none and most were were not in existence such as iPods, Playstations, even television. And the only communication you had from the outside world was a battery operated radio, which was reserved for the news in the evening and maybe a story or some soap opera mama liked. So your great great grandma would listen to soap opera. It was barely daybreak when we were awakened by a rooster screeching his neck and his horrible crowing sound and the smell of biscuits in the oven. There was a basin of water to wash our face and hands and then a toothbrush dipped into baking soda and salt to brush the teeth. Then my mother's yummy biscuits and homemade jam and jelly was freshly churned butter melted in it to spread. A huge glass of milk to drink and carry the dishes to a pan of hot water on the stove with homemade soap making bubbles in it. And the day really began. Until they washed their dishes on the stove. Summertime was greatest when you slipped on underwear and overalls and you were ready to do chores. No shoes in the summer and the chores were habits, so you automatically did them without question as to why or when. Just get up and do your chores. The cows were gathered by the fence, waiting to be milked as you walked by lugging scraps in a huge bucket with other assorted whatevers for the pigs who lay waiting in the mud. The scraps were dumped into a trough, and with a few scratches behind the ear of the hog, you carried the now empty bucket back, placed it at the end of the stove, and once more ran outside. Just me and my brother Dale. We had a bucket in each hand, and the cows let out a moo as they saw us coming. A short stool was outside the milking area, 
along a portion of the fence that they always came to. And putting down one bucket, we each picked up a short stool. We climbed through the fence and selected a cow. We usually worked the cows the same each day. Dad had put hay in the area and as they munched with slobber dropping from their jaws, we placed our stools beside our cow, moving her to a position where it would be hard for her to kick the milk over, or us. She could kick them too, yeah. A cat usually placed itself in position so that once in a while we would squirt milk in its direction and it would lick its lips in anticipation of another drop or so of the milk left on its whiskers. My brother could always get more milk than I could from a cow, so when I finished one cow, he was already finishing up on the second cow. I would take his stool and start on another cow as he sat on my stool and finished milking my cow. This went on until all the cows were milked. Buckets were full and these we lugged back to the house where my mom would strain the milk several times and let them set so the cream would settle on the top. Once the cream had settled on the top of the milk, we would skim it off and put it in a different container and later when we had enough we churned it into butter. Once the cows were milked, the pig slopped and things like carrying in wood for the stove, we had time just to be kids. When you sit on the bottom step of the porch and draw circles with bare toes is when the real thinking takes over. Planning for the next few hours takes a lot of imagination and thought process. My brother Dale usually thought of something for us to do. He was older and much wiser or so he thought. And I was just the kid that followed him around attempting to copy him. As a youngster without all the fancy electrical things of today, the mind thinks constantly of what to do and how to do it. Freedom then meant swimming in the pond, a walk through the woods, while the dogs chased rabbits or found a slow moving turtle, a snake could be seen and followed till we grew tired, or one of the dogs attacked it and began the ritual of slinging it from side to side to break its neck, then dropping it to the ground for some creature to devour at will. Ooh, something's going to eat it. Mm. We always made sure we made it to the railroad tracks to wave to the engineer. My brother always carried a gun, just in case he spotted a squirrel or an edible bird. When we grew tired or heard Mama whistle for us to come home, we knew half the day was over. We ate lunch. After lunch, it was weed the garden time, but this only took a little of the afternoon, so we went free till milking time again or gathered eggs from the hen house. Mama always fed her chickens. This would usually mean we could lazily wander or go fishing in the pond behind the house. I could go across the road to a falling down piece of the house and play with my catalogs. She would get the catalogs and cut them out and paste them onto cardboard and make them into to little like Barbie dolls. Or maybe talk to my brother into going swimming or wander to the huge railroad bridge. Muddy up the water underneath and catch catfish in a bucket we had brought. Our days were filled with imaginations of what ifs. What if, what if? Type curiosity. Chores, good food, and a happy home. We could imagine the weekend and maybe some homemade ice cream or some cousins who usually dropped in every Sunday. Life was work and play, but inside was only used to eat, sleep, and hear the news of a thing called World War II, and how they didn't know who they were messing with when they took on America. Never lose your imagination and curiosity as it is what 
makes America strong, according to my father. That would be your great-great-grandfather. Breathe the fresh air, he would say. Smell that it's freedom, he would say. But to me, it smelled a bit like cow manure. And thoughts of cleaning the chicken house took the smile away for a second. Uh, the chicken house, she thought about cleaning the chicken house and she wasn't happy for a second because that's hard work. Well, it's hard stinky work is what it is. Well, I hope you enjoyed that story and I also hope that you're having fun on your vacation, your winter break. I love you, Jazz Bear. And your mama loves you too. She will always love you. Always, always, always. Even though we may not have a physical body here, we have a spiritual body. She will always love you. And I love you too. Mm -hmm.